Hello one and all, and welcome to Behind the Glass, your weekly automotive podcast hosted by two rather uninformed enthusiasts. Nah, 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 nah. <laughs> I'm Sam from the YouTube channel Seen Through Glass. I'm Tony from Gravelwood Car Sales. And you can watch us each week on YouTube. You can also listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and most podcast players. We hope you enjoy the episode. I, I'll be honest. I'll be honest. We've already recorded. <laughs> we've already recorded the start of this podcast. I didn't like it. I am. I am blaming Baby Brain. Tony thinks that's not a real thing. No, but it is. It is. I have lost brain cells due to my baby. I'm blaming my baby. But but you were like this before you had the baby. <laughs> you you would have. You must have other kids there somewhere else because Shh. you. <laughs> I I really am struggling to string a sen- sentence together. There you go. See <laughs> sentence. And this Do you know what it is? What? I'll tell you what it is, mate. It's because the stupid tyres that we're going to talk oh, about yeah. all over. This is what... It's nothing to do with the baby. That's what's ruined my brain it, cells. It's that you've you, yeah. you got... I'm going to bore you all. Yeah. It's going to be an awful 10-minute segment where I'm going to nerd out about my stress to do with GT3 tyres. Um, we're going to get onto that, but I, we're going to start off on a positive. <laughs> okay. Which is obviously reviewing or discussing... The major moment that was collecting my GT3, which yeah. I did on Friday last week. The video went out on Sunday. Um, what a moment, what an experience. I, I have already asked you. We're going to ask you again. Oh. <laughs> Thoughts on the car now that you've seen it? Lovely, mate. Thank you so much. Amazing. And you're, you have said that you think the colour is even better in the flesh. Yeah. I, I, I mean, we do get that sometimes, by the way, where you look at a photo and you go, yeah, that's a lovely colour. And then... You look at it in person, and it's so much better. You get it. I've seen that all the while, you know, down the years. So, and it's amazing because that color does really change in different lights. So, unbelievably, today we had snow this morning, and now we've got bright. It's sunshine. called it's frost. We've had frost. No, 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 deep done. snow. <laughs> when you're driving a GT3, that was deep <laughs> snow. It's about ten centimeters. <laughs> um, but yeah, so now it's a beautiful, bright, sunny day. But I've seen the car inside, outside, under clouds, in rain. And it really changes that that green. Um, but I'm super, super pleased with it. You're not convinced by the checkerboard interior, the, the Pasha? No, 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 no. Had you ever seen it before? Have you ever seen Pasha in any no, portion? I, I, I don't think I have because I would have remembered such a hideous... <laughs> <laughs> so you didn't say that last time around. I now regret restarting the recording of this episode. But it, it yeah, anyway. Um, and it does make you cross eyed, by the way, because I did come in here thinking everything was black and white. Yeah, you sort of go a bit dizzy if you look yeah. at it too long. <laughs> yeah. But it's from your era, Pasha. It's early 1980s. It, it was 94s, 98s, a few 911s. You must have seen it at some point. Or somebody you must have known must have owned one of those cars with Pasha interior, surely. Yeah, probably. But I didn't, I mean. Didn't care about it. It was, it was early 80s. I mean, it was a baby, mate. No, you, you were in, uh, 15 early, years old. Uh, <laughs> Are early, you kidding? Uh, you fifth, I had one. <laughs> I probably nicked one. You probably did <laughs> nick one. It is supposed there's a bit of... It's not clear exactly where Pasha came from or why it came into existence. <laughs> um, some say it's supposed to represent a waving checkered flag to kind of hint towards Porsche racing heritage. Um, but yeah, as we, as we mentioned, if you stare at it long enough, it's just a way to go cross-eyed. Um, it's a wacky wacky fabric but one that i've always really liked and when i found out i could only have a black interior i wanted to do something with regards to seat inserts or something like that and a lot of people do tartan or pepita i didn't want to do the houndstooth i think it's just a bit done i actually don't love houndstooth that much um reminds me of tails from you know when you wear a morning suit do you you know what i mean yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so i'm not that big a fan and then tartan i used to wear that to school literally (laughs) yeah i literally that's why i don't like it reminds me of school having to wear tails sunday tails um uh but yeah so and then tartan i think it would be really tough to get a tartan for that green it's too light a color so that's why pasha was the route i wanted to go and i'm really pleased i i know a lot of people will be like what um, it's quirky, it's wacky, but for me, it, it's perfect. And every time I get in that car, it makes me smile. It makes me very, very happy. It makes you makes you smile as you get in because once you're in, you can't see it. No, I can because I see it between my legs and around me. It's on the door cards as well. Don't forget. So I see it everywhere. That's it's on the I door love. cards. It's on the door cards. Oh as well. my god! Yeah. You really ruined it. <laughs> <laughs> I have to do a big shout out to D Class Automotive because they did an amazing job. It is real factory finish. <laughs> 
uh, work that they did. And uh, yeah, Tony, you'll be relieved to hear they can also put it back to factory spec. Uh, if Thank I ever God. Need to. But um, no, I, I'm I'm super super happy. And the whole collection experience was great. It was a little bit marred by the fact that I was filming. Like I, I did say it in the video when it went live. It's really hard to be present and enjoy a moment when you're filming it. You know, that is, that's my job. Like, like doing yeah. social media is my job. Yeah. And obviously I put a lot of pressure under myself, point proven today, because we had to restart this podcast after 10 minutes because I just didn't like what I was saying. So I am my, I'm my own biggest critic. And so it, on a day like that, I'm just endlessly thinking about what shots I need to get, how I can get different shots, what I want to say. And so it's super hard to just relax into it. And it's the same when we've been on road trips. I often hate filming driving days because you never enjoy the driving. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. It's constantly yeah. thinking about, okay, where can I get flyby? I've got yeah, the right yeah. GoPro angle. What am I going to say here? So um, we've never been on a road trip where you've not filmed. Yeah, it's very, there's only a few times that yeah. I've done it. And actually they often end up being the best days. Of course. Um, usually in America for Monterey Car Week, I do the quail rally, which happens at the start of the week, the first two days of the week. And I film one day and I hit the second day off. And every single time I've done that, that second day has been one of the best days of my entire life. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it, I need to do it more often. But yeah, it was still, it was a great experience. Porsche Guildford were fantastic, looked after me very well, um, gave me some nice little toys for the baby, which I thought was very sweet of them. Um, and let me do my own thing. And yeah, no, it was, it was all brilliant. Um, but I kind of wish I could do it all over again, not having to film, if that makes sense. No. But it has not been without stress. And this is where I'm going to bore you all to misery right now because <laughs> tires. <laughs> uh, I always knew that I wanted to do the first 1,000 miles in that car immediately because the 992 GT3 has a, has a run-in period. 900, like a really weird number. It's like 932 miles or something. Yeah. Strange. And you're supposed to only go up to 6,000 RPM, not the 9,000 RPM. Red line, it's lit everything, ease itself in. Um, and originally I was going to do that by going down to the GP ice race in Austria. I think we spoke about this last week. Really sadly, that event's been cancelled because there's not enough snow. Um, and so, yeah, because that was going to be the first trip, I was getting myself some winter tyres. Because uh, I knew if I was going to snowy, icy conditions, I needed proper winter tyres, especially on the GT3. Uh, originally, well, actually, you know, Porsche themselves do offer a winter tyre and wheel package for the GT3. And essentially, uh, all the wheels are an inch narrower. So that when you put the tyres on, you make a greater impact in the snow and get more grip. But I spoke to Porsche UK or Porsche GB and Porsche Reading, who are the sort of main uh, Porsche retailers here in the UK. And they said, look, you can put our advised or our approved winter tyres onto a standard GT3 wheel. They will still work. So I went out there to try and find them. The approved tyres are Michelin Alpine fives and Goodyear like ultra grip something something somethings and the sizes are weird the, the rears especially are huge like 305 30 r21s or something like massive tires uh and you just i just couldn't find them like, they yeah. just didn't they just were not are you sure they're 305 there? not 315 the summer tires are 315 right, so the okay. tires i got now are 315 yeah, but, they're as they're for the winter tires. they're a bit narrower right, fine. so i could have probably got 315s i did actually look to see if i could get some 315s but they are also impossible winter tires i think in general at the moment are hard to come by well it's winter it's winter so <laughs> everyone's already got them <laughs> supply so, and demand yeah, supply and demand uh but also in that size because like you know it's only a few people that are going to be driving GT3s or sports cars with those kind of tyres around in the winter. And, and don't forget as well, mate, apart from the UK, most of Europe is law. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So, and it should be here. I mean, now now that the the climate is changing, we're getting colder, grubbier, icier, winterier this conditions. Is, this is, I mean, that's, I've never, I mean, can we start again? No. Because that's like the most stupid thing I've ever heard you say. Oh well, my God. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, no, 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 we, no. You wait a we minute. We have had cold winters here forever and hot summers forever. But do you not think we are getting more extreme weather conditions more regularly? Well, n possibly. I mean, I don't really know. Like, I'm not trying to Greta Thunberg you. I'm just no, saying. No, no, but, but can I just can I just rewind a few weeks ago when you couldn't make it up the lane to your dealership in an Audi RS6? Oh, it's just a car's pile of poo. No, wrong tyres, mate. If you're on winter tyres, you would have gl glid, glide, glod, glidden, 
<laughs> Glidden. <laughs> what do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> glided, <laughs> glided up there. See, but, baby brain. But that but that happens every single year at my work. Yeah, but without foul. Wrong tyres, mate. That's what I'm saying. If in this country, more people had all season tyres or winter tyres, you would have been absolutely fine. But I, I, I'd have gone up in a Range Rover, no problem, mate. Because all season tyres. Range Rover's come with all season tyres. Have they? Yeah. Oh, well, there you go then. There you go. Oh, God. Sometimes. But, mate, can I just... It doesn't make a blind bit of difference. It does make a huge difference. You no, the, ti- the tyres... The, the tyres make a bit of difference. But what I'm saying is, extreme weather here has always been cold. So, you know, but therefore, if we're going to get more of it, which maybe we are... Maybe we're not. Maybe we're not. But it feels like the last few years we have. But also, just in general... Why not switch to winter tyres? If you're in a sportier car or if you're in a lane which get lots of ice like the one you're on, put winter tyres on. Climate, all season tires. climate change, people are saying the world's getting warmer, not colder. No, we're seeing more extreme weather. So you're getting floods, we're getting uh, uh, what's called wildfires. We're getting Floods all the while. Floods when I was no, a but, kid. But, but at d- stranger parts or times of the year, unexpected times of the year. So Mexico's getting snow when it should be in a heat wave. Floods in parts of the world where it should be dry season. Uh, yeah, wildfires in times when it should be wet season. Yeah, more snow, more ice, more heat waves. You can't... I agree. I am not someone who is a... Um, not a speculator, but someone who gets, you know, I'm not going over the top. I'm not like, oh, it's crazy. But statistically, in the period of time that we've been taking statistics, I hasten to add, we are seeing more extreme weather conditions. Around the world. Around the world. Around the world. Well, but that can't be just down to fossil fuels then, because they say it's because it's because it's because we've heated the world up. We've changed the climate or the climate is changing. I am nowhere near intelligent enough or well-read enough to tell you exactly all the reasons to why. My only thing I is... I don't think anyone knows. As me as a human, as a person, like just on my own thing without reading into it, I would imagine that the Earth has been through quite a few changes climatically in the billions of years that it's existed. Yeah. Ice ages dinosaur eras yeah like you know yeah, I, yeah. I, I would assume this is not the first time that we've gone through a climatic change no. as as a planet yeah but anyway people are going to be screaming at us yeah, yeah this is <laughs> we have waded into a very strange territory let's get back to tires yeah. um so so yeah so couldn't find them a very kind viewer called eric from sweden got in touch and said look i put the standard 992 carrera four tire winter tires on my car they fit so i ordered those from italy it's the only way to, I could find them. In uh, they came. Then G browser gets cancelled. So I'm like, fine, just stick the P zeros on. That's what I was always going to do. No stress. Plotted a, a road trip uh, through France, actually, which is what I was going to do instead of going to ice race. And then checked the forecast last week and snow. All in France. Snow, snow. Everyone's going snow, 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 snow. Because I'm going to a lot of like high up roads. Snow, snow. So I was like, damn it, need the winter tyres again. Call Porsche Guildford, put the winter tyres on. Guildford say those rear tyres are way too narrow. We shouldn't stretch them. That's a safety risk. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, what a fail. I speak to Jonathan Benson at Tire Reviews, absolute hero, pick his brains. He's like, that, that is risky. I, yeah. I, I would not do that. So back to the search, like trying to find tyres, trying to find tyres, speak to Michelin, speak to Pirelli, speak to everyone. Like, can I find, no one's got the tyres. Eventually, I find a set of the narrower 305 winter tyres, Michelin Alpine fives in Glasgow rears so they've got the rears i've got new fronts at guildford i'm like great let's combine those two there's a set call up guildford they say sorry we can't actually fit we're not allowed to fit used tires here mm-hmm. so i'm like great so i've somehow got to get rear used tires from glasgow and new front tires from guildford together to a legitimate established trustworthy tire fitting shop get all the tires fitted they've got to keep hold of my p0s for a week go off on my trip come back switch, switch them all over again then God knows what I'll do with the winter tyres. And that's all going to happen in two days. So, so I am so unnecessarily stressed by it. Up a tree without a paddle. Yeah, and it's <laughs> just dominating my life. And I'm sorry, I've just spoken about it for like 20 minutes. And it's so boring for all of you. Well, actually, we spoke about it for 40 minutes. Yeah, we've got to do it again. <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> but I just, I had to share because it's, it is dominating. Vicky wants to stab me because I'm spending my life on tyre websites and calling people and chasing eBay sellers that just don't want to reply. I'm fairly sure I've been scammed on eBay. Oh no, here we go. Uh, Ah, yes. On their way in the next half an hour. Yes! 
Okay. What, are they coming here? No. Well, oh, <laughs> the rear tires are on their way, people, somewhere. I don't know where. Anyway, so let's move on. So, um, hold on a minute. If there's a tire shop in Guildford that can fit these tires, let him know. It'll be too late by now. It. No. By the time this episode goes out, oh, no. I should theoretically be on the way. Oh, no. So I'll be off somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, oh, no. Let's move on. Let's move on because, yeah, there's been a lot of GT3 content <laughs> across all of my channels, and I'm sure we've got more to speak about. Oh, we will speak more about... Uh, the car after my first trip in it. And I'll share more. Yeah, because it won't be in one piece, you'll be on your roof. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk to you about your Porsche experience oh, this yeah. weekend because I actually think it's a bit more interesting. Well, that's harsh, but uh, let's get into it because what Porsche were you driving around in at the weekend? Tony? I have taken in part exchange, ladies and gentlemen, a Porsche Taycan. Sport Turismo GTS. Now, if I was a very wealthy man, like me. with a <laughs> like you, with a very short commute to do each day, I'd be all over that. No, I've got a different analogy on that, but oh. okay. You no, you, you carry on. Do you know the difference between Sport Turismo and Cross Turismo? Yeah, the Cross Turismo is jacked up. Ah, like, okay. it's like an all road A six. Fine. So Sport- the Sport Turismo is just an estate. Yeah, it's like an RS six. Fine, okay. Um, so, uh, you took it in. Now, prior to you having this experience at the weekend, if I was to say to you someone's going to give you a Taycan and Part X, what was your immediate guttural reaction? Well, had it not been the Sport Turismo, I wouldn't have taken it in Part Exchange anyway. Okay. Because Taycans, in general, there's millions of them. There's, they're available. The Sport Turismo is the only one, and the GTS is very important is the only one at the moment that's really, really thin on the ground. So I wouldn't have not took it in because I don't like the car, because you're going to find out in a minute. I really like the car. Oh, I'm it's, shocked. It's the... There's just a lot of them. Yeah, okay, fine. So from so, a business point of view, it's just... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so I just want to jump straight in on that, because you just said you really like it. Oh, I, yeah. Th- that's shocked me, because... We drove a Taycan cross Turismo in LA. Do you remember? Oh, I like the car though, mate. You know, at the time you were, I'm sorry, you were not complimentary at the time. You yeah, well, were I was winding Phil it up. Yeah, but. Yeah, I was like, only doing it to wind him up. Oh, fair enough. Yeah, fair I was just uh, trying to get a reaction from him. Sorry, <laughs> Philip, I'm, I'm sure you don't listen, but I was trying what to go, go in on him. So, okay, so, but have you, or I feel like you haven't liked Taycans before. No, I, I mean, I've regularly said on this podcast that. Um, if the Taycan is the best electric car you can buy, in my opinion, sure, okay. I, I've often said that. Okay, fair enough. You have. I remember. I remember they're, they're not. Then you know they're not a bit of me in general. But if I had to go and buy one tomorrow, it would be a Taycan because I think that's the best car available. And so, has the last few days lived up to to that sort of? Thought? From a car point of view, it's fantastic. It is good. Isn't it, it is fantastic bit of kit. I actually yeah. love. Like, I I'm the same as you. I absolutely adore them. I. Last year did that uh, ice driving experience. The Taycan was arguably the most exciting experience yeah. on ice. I was just mad. It's ballistic. I love yeah. the Turbo S, but the the whole package, the technology, the way it drives, you can't hear it. If you're just doing what I've been doing in it the last three or four days, I've done seven hundred miles. By wow, the way. fair play. So, um, which is pretty standard for you. Let's just make that. Yeah, clear. yeah, yeah, yeah. This is why we'll come back round to it. But this is why an electric car wouldn't always be for me. Um, but yeah, you know, in terms of performance and, um, space, uh, well, the boot's not quite as I big. was about to ask that. Yeah. How's the practicality? Been? Yeah. So the boots, cause it's a, it's a little bit slopey at the back. Um, it's not quite as, as big as an RS6, but in terms of performance and what it does, I would compare it. To the, 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 the petrol equi- equivalent would be an RS6. Not an RS4. No, no. Do you not think a Panamera is an RS6 rival? Yeah, but a Taycan's not much smaller inside than a Panamera. Oh, really? No, no. The the boot's smaller. smaller, It's not much smaller, mate. It's it's got a little bit of a lower headlining, uh, but it's roof roof lining, yeah. yeah. Headlining's inside. Uh, I knew what you were trying to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) But it does ride lower as well, by the way. it sits lower. It sits lower, and it... But inside the space would be very. I, I, I in the cabin, yeah. I bet if you looked at the space, they'd, they'd be very similar. Sure, 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 sure. It really is a a lovely car to drive. And like I said to you just a minute ago, 
the petrol equivalents nowadays, people go, oh, I'm going to buy an RS6 for the noise. It's got a great big V8. In general, most of the time, you can't hear the bloody thing anyway. Well, it's so I, quiet now. I think the opposite. I think it makes a worse synthetic noise. That was my experience with the RS6 is that it always made this stupidly fake burble. Like, and that's it, come from the speakers. 20 miles an hour. Yeah, that's what I mean. It yeah, was yeah, fake. Yeah. It was synthetic. So yeah. at that point, you're not even really getting a true combustion engine noise yeah. unless you really step on it. So yeah, you're right. Most cars are getting quieter, at least in terms of usable daily cars. They're getting quieter. So in general, yeah, yeah. yeah. Everything's getting, especially in the cabin. Oh, you've got the sound isolating glass and got, you know, sound isolating yeah. tires and everything. So, um, but to drive for you, were you just using it as a wafter? Did you do any sort of spirited anything? Done everything. Done everything. Okay, done, fine. done, done. A roads, B roads, motorways, town driving, everything. So I've, I've done, I've used it exactly the same as I would use a petrol car. Fine. Okay. Exactly the same. Which may same or may driving. not be a mistake. We're about to find that out, I guess, in a second. But, yeah. Um, I just had another question, hold on a sec. Uh, uh, wait. Oh, price, price. So hold on a sec. How much will this go up for? Have you figured that out yet? N- about 130 grand. Okay. And knew it would have been, what, 160 or something? Or 50? No, no, no. Not that much? No, not, not the GTS. The GTS are probably 120. Oh, fine. So okay. They're, they're, okay. They're, they're the only ones that are a bit over. Fine. Okay. And the tu- but the turbo, they don't... The they turbo don't... S is one, uh, 150, 160. Yeah, okay, fine. That's yeah. what I was thinking about. It's more um, power, though. Okay, so we're, we're probably... 20 or 30 grand on the used market over an RS6? Is that Similar, yeah, because I've yeah. got an RS6 in stock now at 100 oh, grand. Yeah. Well, that's convenient. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> look at us. This is a newer gravel. car. This is a year newer, this car. So okay. if you went, this is basically a new car. It's, a, it's, it's four weeks old. Sure. Um, it's done a thousand miles. So if you had a four week old thousand mile RS6 four sprung, be similar money. It'd be okay. ten grand different. Okay, that's probably. a little bit more interesting yeah. because a lot of my rhetoric around EVs has been that they tend to be overpriced. But if you compare it, I say to a, an RS six, we're kind of in the same ballpark. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but in general, you're right; they are overpriced. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, okay. Well, get let's get into your experience then as an electric vehicle. So you love the Taycan. Taycan's brilliant. I think we're all agreed on that. It's almost never been doubted, but how have you, as a EV hater, <laughs> got on with living with an EV? Yeah, and I've and I've really, really tried, and I have to take that hate away. I, I've just, I've been All your very impartial. Just everything, mate. I've I've been very patient. I well, I didn't actually know we was doing this EV episode, but this weekend I had a lot of running around to do. But I did have some time, so I thought, you know, because I could have used any other car, could have used any other car at work could use the RS6 even so um but I, I thought I have got a bit of time I'm I'm gonna suck it and see and I'm gonna use the Taycan exactly I'm gonna drive it the same as I drive a petrol car I'm, I'm gonna use it exactly I'm gonna put the heaters on I'm gonna turn them off when I want I'm gonna do exactly the same um routine as I would normally do now the 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 big problem with the car is the range it's a problem now i don't have a home charger and i know for sure if i did have a home charger it would be better absolutely because i would come out every single morning and it would be full up so that would help me absolutely but i've done so many miles over the last four or five days, I still would have had to have stopped. Like yesterday, I wake up yesterday morning, um, I went to the New Forest, I went to the Ferrari dealer because I had to switch from about the 296. It's a journey I often do. I would often go in a big high-powered petrol car. The last time I went, I did go in the RS6, for instance. So the just to give you an example, I left my house it's about 120 miles ish to the new forest from my house. I had 80, 90 mile range in the Taycan. So, do you know how many percent that was? Um, it would have been late 40s, nearly 50%, roughly. Uh, oh, no, it would have been a bit more than that, actually, because 
Uh, no, it would have been, sorry, sorry. 50% is about 100 miles in that car, roughly. So I would have had nearly 100%, uh, nearly 50%. So I knew that I was going to have to charge. I, wouldn't, I knew I weren't going to get down there. So I stopped at Cobham Services. Uh, I get to Cobham Services um, early in the morning, half past eight, quarter to nine. That journey in a petrol car, if I left at eight o'clock in the morning, I would be at the New Forest with a stop. By the time I stop for a coffee, perhaps even put some fuel in the car, I would get to the New Forest at quarter to ten, for instance, say. So I knew it was going to take longer in the electric car. I get I gets to Cobham, 20 to 9-ish. All the charge points are full. The fast chargers. I want a fast charger, by the way. I know there's some smaller chargers further down, and I know I could have used them, but they're 50 kilowatt, and I want the fast chargers, which are 250, 350 kilowatt. So I didn't wait that long. I waited 10 minutes, and then I got on. I'd never used the chargers before in my life. Very easy to use. Do you remember what brand? Do you remember uh, Ionity? Yeah, okay. So sense. they're a new, yeah, no, they're a new charging brand. Very, very not that new, by the way. Okay, fine, <laughs> but they're established. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but big three hundred and fifty kilowatt. Yeah, chargers, yeah, yeah. They're right? the ones to go for. So, um, I goes in. I punch my details in, scan the QR code, put my bank details, you know, the, my card details, plug the car in, charge. Um, I waited um, 40 minutes. I went and got coffee, mm -hmm. probably. I went and had a roll. I come back. 40 minutes, it was like 85% charge. And this is the problem. And EV owners will, will probably second this as well. Just because you're pulling up to a 250 kilowatt charge or 350 kilowatt, when it's charging, it doesn't give you that. The most it'll ever really give you is 150, and then it works its way down as the battery goes up and it trickles it in even less. So the 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 claim that you can charge a, a, a Taycan or an electric car from 0 to 80% on a fast charger in 20 minutes is crap. It's a complete lie. Because I went to several chargers over the network over the course of the weekend, and the quickest I charged it to 80%, with some range in it, was about 40 minutes. Okay. It wasn't 20 minutes at all. Sure. While we're on the subject of chargers, some of the Tesla network have now been opened up to non-Tesla products. To shout out Tesla, them chargers are the best chargers on the network. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. They are. You download the app. You literally pull up to it, you press charge, you plug it in, your bank details are already saved on the app, you're in. They are, bosh. they are easily, the infrastructure of Tesla easily the best, uh, from what I've experienced yeah. over the last four yeah, or five days. So, but same again, they're 250, 350 kilowatt chargers. The max they'll give you is 150, 140. So it, it's the same. That's nothing to do with the Taycan. No, no, no. That's no. the charger. That's okay. the. That's not the car. That's okay. the. That's the charger. Because sure. the, the, you know, you could charge it in twenty minutes. The manufacturers say you can charge it in twenty minutes if you get the full two fifty or three fifty yeah. kilowatt. But the chargers never give you that. Sure. So, I'm I, 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 and this is complete ignorance on my side. Um, but you know, obviously, different cars can take different charge levels, right? Correct. Because. For example, the AMG I had, that um, EQS, whatever, that was about 20 minutes, 20 to 80%. Right, okay. It, you know, if I wanted to go up to 100%, it's about 33, 34 minutes. But was that from nearly flat or did you... That was about 20%. It was, it was you know, right. it was 15 to 20% okay. up. Because, t like, so, f for instance, last night I was on the Tesla charger, charger last night, and um, I was a six mile range. So yeah. I was really, 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 really like 2%. Yeah, yeah. And, and I was 35, 40 minutes to get to 80%. Yeah. So, but that's all to do with battery management, isn't it? That that's the cars are built, the battery packs and everything like that to, to maximize their charging up to that point, because then I guess so, yeah. it, it then really reduces and everything trickles down to extend battery life and battery management. So it's not, 
overcharging, which is why there's always the advice that charge up to 80%. It's the most efficient way to do it. It's the quickest. It protects your battery life long term. You'll get the maximum efficiency and range rather than sitting there trying to charge up to 100% that final 15 or 20 minutes. It's going to take take you longer. It's slower. You're going to get less efficiency. You're going to damage the battery, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you're, you're also, you're on the clock. You're paying on the clock. Yeah. So that last 20%, you are right because you're, you're, you know, you're paying the same amount of money and it's trickling slower. Yeah. So you might as well get cracking, hit the road uh, and your time management wise, you're better off taking two 20 minute stops to 80%. Rather than one to forty-five minute for one hundred percent. Is this uh, what I'm saying? Like, well, I I do see what yeah. you're saying, but but if if the difference between eighty and a hundred percent gets you home or gets you where you need to be, and then you can charge for nothing or cheaper, then you, why would you want to stop again? You just you might as well just pay the extra little bit of money. And it's and, all sort of man math. Home. There's de- there's definitely yeah. man math in it. But I, I know for sure I've been told, and I say, baby brain, and the fact that I've been out of the EV game for a while because I hasten to say we did talk about all of this a good couple of years ago. <laughs> just seems to be that in the last month or so, suddenly EV crisis has been in the headlines of all these yeah. papers. So we're talking about it once again. But there's definitely something to do with say with protecting the long-term life of the battery, the aim of, of charging. But that'll be the car 80%. at that point. Exactly, that's that, what I mean. Yeah, like, that, there's that, definitely that, an element where they advise you to not charge to 100% every time. Yeah, but the the, the the charger in the car, you almost can't damage the battery because the, the charger in the car trickle it in. Yes. To, yeah, so to, yeah, it's, like your, it's like your mobile phone. You know, your mobile phone will go to 80% at night really quickly and the last 20% trickles in to preserve the battery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that's all good. Now, the I want to talk about pricing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Because if the gem, if 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 the if the governments, this is a government issue. Mm-hmm. If the governments want people to go EV, they have to look at the pricing on the in these chargers because some of these chargers uh, companies are taking the piss with what they charge to the point, mate. It's no cheaper than a combustion car, even an RS six. So I have spent as much... Which is one of the most expensive combustion cars to run. Correct. I have spent as much money over the last uh, three or four days, four days, five days, putting electric in this Taycan than what I would have fuel in the RS6. It's it's almost identical, and it's a piss take. And you're charging more often in the Taycan. We have to say the Taycan is one of the worst for range in terms of that price point and where it positions itself you know there are plenty of other vehicles that do much better range than the Taycan now but but they also lie in, I think they, they all, all lie. lie I've got some screenshots you know because uh, Tony kind of half mentioned it you know this is a bit of an EV special because over Christmas really it became as I said there's been so much noise here in the UK about maybe people suddenly waking up to the fact that EVs uh, well, the, maybe the UK is not quite ready for, for everyone to go into electric vehicles. And, and, you know, mainstream media and social media, everyone's been talking about it. And and there was, uh, I'm just going to try and find the tweet here. So this is a, a guy on Twitter, um, uh, Jamie Fretwell. This Peugeot E208, its 50 kilowatt battery is claimed to get 217 miles. It's cold, but I hoped 169, 196 miles would be doable. I did 98 miles. It showed 30 miles remaining. I nursed it 17 miles to the services. It showed nine miles remaining. Yeah. So 124 miles of real world yeah. range. Um, you know, and I think that's been well discussed that all, of the, apart from that AMG, apart from that Mercedes, which I actually genuinely felt like did more range than it predicted. Right. Every other electric vehicle I've been in has lied. As, uh, uh, as well not to go to the, the defence of an electric car, but it wasn't as cold as it as it has been now when you had that Which doesn't help. Which doesn't help. Yeah. So so the, 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 the claimed miles on the on the take is two hundred and thirty miles, right? Yeah. So but in this weather, in reality, I'm about one seventy. So it will say one ninety, two hundred when it's fully charged. But you're not you're not getting that, and the real difference I see is is they're worse on the motorway. If you're doing seventy mile an hour on the motorway or yeah. eighty mile an hour electric car on a motorway, then 
the, the range goes down quicker than the miles that you're doing mm -hmm. and that and that's all the while and i do a lot of motorway miles mm -hmm. in in a combustion car and i can give you a really really good example of this so when i picked the taycan up um well i took in part exchange for the gt3 touring so that's how that's how i come about it so i drove the gt3 touring up to cambridge services when i left my work it showed 176 miles now bear in mind this is a Big four liter engine. You're thirsty. Engine. I mean, the GC3 is the thirsty. Yeah. I, I figured that out in the last 40 miles that I've driven my car. I, I, I drove it. I drove the both cars exactly the same. It was all motorway. Yeah, I wasn't yeah. speeding 75 ish mile an hour. When I got to Cambridge Services, so starting at 176, I got to Cambridge Services, which is about an 80 mile drive from my work. Mm -hmm. It said 139 miles. Mm -hmm. So it, it hadn't done the miles that it said. I drove the Taycan back. I'd done 80 miles of range, 80 miles. Yeah, you basically, you don't gain in an EV. I've never, no. I've never driven an EV and you've been able to increase your range. Where in a combustion engine vehicle, your range estimate does tend to change depending on your driving style or your yeah. driving technique. You can eke it out. You can also reduce it. But in an EV, it says you've got a hundred mile range. That's only going down. And yeah. often it goes down quicker than your actual miles that you're, you're doing. A plus, a yeah. plus yeah. Uh, from that range. That uh, This is what all what I've found over the last few days. If you're on a B road or you're on a road that requires you to brake and you're on and off the accelerator, the miles doesn't go down as quickly. Wait, it, more regen, basically. More regen, and as well, when when you're if you're on a, if you're in an electric car, you're on the accelerator all the time, so you're constantly using the battery. Whereas when you're when you're on a B road, you're braking, you're accelerating, you're regening the or, or, or recouping, they call it. The Taycan's got a recoup button. Mm -hmm. um, so when I was on B roads, it was it was better of course essentially yeah which you know and and okay so let's let's move this on from your i think wholly positive experience with the taycan well as a as a whole because i want to kind of progress the conversation on but uh, if you've got no i'm going to come to the positive bits now okay if in from what i've experienced this is what i've experienced right if i had a charger at home and a charger at work, my experience would have been better. It wouldn't have been a lot better because I've been out on the road a lot, so I've had to rely on the network. But what it would have done, I still would have had to have stopped over the course of the weekend nearly every day, but I would have left my house full up, which would have helped. The, um, the problem that I found with it and this is not the car or even the charging network the real problem that i found i've lost my train of thought now the problem that you found is the demand or the price or the what was the issue you... ah no, no no so what what made me really nail it down was if you are a business user right or a company car driver for me, it's a no-brainer for you to have an electric car. How come? Because of the the benefit in the kind and the cost saving that you the have. The tax incentives, essentially. The tax incentives that you have to have an electric car. And most people, unlike me, don't do the miles that I do, okay? So, say you're, you've got a company car allowance, right? You You have a Golf now. You spend... Five hundred pound a month, six hundred pound a month, roughly on um, fuel and company car tax. You pay nothing on an electric car, so you're seven, eight grand a year better off. And if you compare the Taycan to an RS six, if you're a company director like me and you want to run a Taycan every day, zero benefit in kind. If you want to run an RS six. It's about 18 grand a year in company car tax. That's a huge saving. If you're a normal person and you, you're you just buying an EV and you've got to pay double what you'd pay for a petrol car, you're getting some more inconvenience 
And the real, real big one is the home charging. For me, you have to be able to charge it at home. If you can't charge it at home, you're wasting your time. And I've seen this over the course of the weekend because I've had to experience it. And I've also spoken to owners. They're all very, very friendly. By I've the always way. found that whenever you stop at a charging point, everyone wants to chat. They're all because they've got loads of time. Yeah, yeah. For a yeah. start, but also I think you, there's that feeling of like early adopters, which I mean now it's not really that early, but there's a sort of sense of like we're in this together. How are you getting on? Where have you been charging? What range are you doing? Like, yeah. And there's a lot of people that turn up for the first time, and everyone helps each other out. Yeah. How do you plug in? Like, yeah, all all very nice. And and I had a conversation with someone the other day, and they said it's not for everyone this electric mm. game. The, the bloke at the nail on the head that's the problem mm -hmm. it's not for everyone but the government this is how the government want us to go and because it's not it is for some people and like I said if you've got them parameters you can charge your car at home or you can charge it at work you have a company car allowance it is an absolute no brainer go and buy one tomorrow go and buy an electric car tomorrow <laughs> you're motivating me <laughs> no, no, no no because for you for you if perfect you, yeah. Swap the X3 for a Taycan. Then Vicky's car's free. You've got, you got absolutely no benefit in kind, no yeah. nothing. It's a free car. And that is absolutely, as long as you can get it's not over. It's free. Not no, no, no. <laughs> but, but you know, I know. I know. You've yeah. got no, there's no tax yeah, yeah, element. Yeah, of course. So as long as you're not doing the miles or you can charge it at home, most of the time you'd, you'd be all right. Yeah, yeah. You'd, you'd have the odd time in the Taycan where because of the range isn't great, you would have to charge it. But I, if I, if if I had to buy an electric car tomorrow, and I and I, and I had a charger at home, or a charger at work, I still would buy the Taycan because it is the best one. Yeah, well, way, for me personally, as a, a to, to drive, yeah, there are better, more efficient ones. And I say, like, oh, the Mercedes was hideous, but boy, was it good. Like, so yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I, I think saw one of them at the weekend. Actually, Porsche do need to catch up slightly in the EV game, but I think, and this is where we can move the conversation on a little bit. Um, maybe Porsche aren't actually pursuing the full EV mission as much as some other manufacturers because, you know, that Taycan's a little bit old now and we still haven't seen an electric Macan and, you know, we know the electric 911's coming for the 992.2. Um, but there are plenty of other manufacturers pushing far harder in this space. But, you yeah. Mean big, uh, you mean bigger ranges? No, bigger, more products. Okay, fine. Bigger ranges, more products, right. uh, more efficiency, um, better deployment, like everything. Like that, yeah. that Taycan technology now, because of how rapidly EVs are developing, it is old. It's a fantastic car. Fair. But it is old tech. But I don't think in general, and this is my business brain working here, and I've been thinking about this as well, I don't think in general we are going to see anytime soon real big mileage EV cars. And I'll tell you why. Because the government and these private companies are spending billions of pounds on infrastructure and chargers. If we're all running around in EVs that, that are doing five or 600 miles to a charge, and we've never got to use the infrastructure system because we can charge them at home, they'll all go bust. So... And as well, you know, the other thing as well, people saying about technology, oh, I'm going to wait, I'm going to wait another couple of years till they update the batteries, you know, till, you know, I can get 400 miles or 500 miles. But that's the same with a petrol car. You know, like when, you know, when you go in, say you, you buy a Golf R, the previous gen, the new one's always better. We always know that. I think if you're ready to position yourself and you're ready to buy an EV, go and buy one. As on as, as on as, like I said, the parameters are a must for me. You have to be able to charge it at home. Okay, so hold on a sec. So, as I say, because I, I feel like we're slightly going in circles. So, the thing, the thing which you said, which I think is a really good point, is that how many years have we been developing the combustion engine, right? 100. Uh, over 100, I would say. Perfected it. And... Still to this day, you 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 help me out here. A really efficient, good, bog standard petrol, not diesel, petrol engined family car, four hundred, five hundred miles to a tank, roughly, roughly. Over the last fifty years, mm, thirty years, how much has that changed or increased for a good standard family car? I'm not talking about sports cars. Well. 
that that depends on the government because don't what? forget no 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 hold on a second no 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 because you're going in circles a bit no, I'm not okay, okay I'm not okay. because don't forget 20 years ago 30 years ago 25 years ago you could buy a Golf that dumped 55 to the gallon and it was a diesel because that's what the government all told us to buy yes but but, my, but so that, okay let me say the point that I'm trying to make and then you can debunk it my point being if in 150 years we have only gained maybe 100 or 150 miles, maybe 200 miles of range for a combustion engine car. In the world of EVs, when we're really only 15 years or 10, 15 years into the... It's impossible to think that in the next couple of years, we're going to go from a 250 mile, which is a good range for... to suddenly 500 miles. No chance. That, 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 that's the point I'm trying to make. Is yeah. that, is that I, think, I think you made a very good point that, yes... EVs are going to get better and better and more and more efficient and we are going to see greater ranges, but we're not suddenly going to get a thousand mile range EVs in the next five years. No, because you might get specialist vehicles. Yeah. But yeah, you, as you say, for all the reasons, all the conspiracy reasons, but also the physical reasons, like batteries, like everything about it, it's just not suddenly going to increase. You know, at the end of the day, realistically, three to 350,000, sorry, 300 to 350 mile range for an EV, for a standard, it's probably as good as it's going to get in the short term. And I'll tell you another thing. We have actually seen it in fuel, by the way, ladies and gentlemen. And it's a theory that I've had, and I've always kept quiet about it because Mr. Know-It-All and all that crap. But fuel has gone up in general over the last 10 or 15 years. And this could be coincidence or not, but it has gone up rapidly. One, because they've ceased the opportunity to do that. Secondly, cars in general are better on fuel, so they're selling less of it. So they have to put the price up to still make the same amount of money or more. EVs are going to be the same. It'll be exactly the same because the the governments, these companies, the taxes, they've all still got to make their money. And unfortunately, as we've said many times on this podcast, the world revolves around money. Yes, and we, you know... I think we both feel a little frustrated that we're beating the same old drum, right? That, you know, we uh, 18 months ago, the, we were doing weekly EV chats and, you know, and, and ha- if not longer than that, and having these conversations. People are just and, starting talking about it and, now. And now people, we are incredible. And then, no, 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 because <laughs> that makes it sound like we're like, oh, we're so ahead of the times. Like, we are. I think what I meant to say, so that sounded really up ourselves. Like, oh, we're so, what I meant to say is that a lot of people have seen this coming for a while, but it is trickling into the mainstream because over Christmas, one thing that really drew attention to this was the viral footage of like queues at charging stations. And that's something that I wanted to talk about is the other side of it is that, you know, we keep getting told, you know, go EV, push to EV, home charging. And when we saw a lot of that, a lot of the sort of EV evangelists came out saying, well, yeah, but that's just because it's Christmas and there are more people on the road and people are doing longer journeys. Most of the time people are just... But... I've queued this weekend. Yeah. The more of us that go to EVs, when you go on the motorway in the UK, how many times on the motorway do you have a clear stretch of road? And how many times do you pull into a service station or petrol station on the motorway when you're doing a longer journey and not see another soul? People are everywhere. Yeah. People are moving around constantly. Yeah. And if we switch to EVs, okay, home charging, sure, great, but people are still moving around. It's not going to stop people moving around. Most people might have a commute that is 13 miles or whatever the average commute is, fine, but you still see people everywhere. And so charging stations are always going to be in demand. And the more people that move to EVs, the more in demand they're going to be. And those sites that we saw at Christmas of huge queues and massive waiting times will become more and more frequent. So I think long story short is that whilst things are improving and yes, 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 there are still huge problems around running an electric vehicle for many people. And the biggest problem that that I think they need to sort out is not not the range amount, it's the time it takes to get the electric into the car. Because don't forget, mate, a lot of combustion cars, not all, but a lot, will only do 300, 350 mile ranges, right? But when they run out or they get low, which is why when you pull in a petrol station, rarely do you have to really queue because it takes three minutes to fill it back up again. So 
not only are there less charging stations than there are petrol stations, it takes a lot longer to charge it up, which is what causes the queues. And the more and more people that buy these electric cars, it doesn't matter how quickly they put the charging stations up, it's the time that it takes to put the electric in the car that they've got to concentrate on. Don't worry about the miles and the range. Pre- develop a battery that will take a charge fully. Don't lie like I've experienced all weekend. Ta- get, a, get a battery that will take a charge in 10 minutes. Fully charge it. That will bring the cues down. It will keep everyone moving better. And make sure that they all work, because that's another thing as well. And I'll tell you a really funny story quickly, which really actually pissed me off. When I first got the car, I live quite near to a Porsche garage. So not having a home charger, I thought, oh, perfect. It'll be all right. I'll be able to manage, because worst ways, I'm three miles away from a Porsche garage. I was in there and I charge it. I goes in there on Friday afternoon. I left work purposely about an hour early, because I thought, well, I need to get involved. and I need to charge it. I goes into the Porsche garage. I said, uh, chargers, I need to, can you just help me do the charger? Because I've gone to put my card on and it's not responding. And anyway, a lovely lady comes out. She comes out and she said, oh, you need to download the Porsche, my Porsche app. I said, well, uh, I haven't got that. I said, I used, I used to have it. I used to buy a lot of new Porsches, um, but I haven't got it anymore. She said, well, did you buy the Porsche from the network? I said, no, I didn't. She said, well, um, you need to be registered to the car you need to be the registered owner and um, you need to be registered to my Porsche app, which can only be done at dealership when you buy the car from a dealership. So well, that's no good then. So you so couldn't, you, you you couldn't you charge, charge it a Porsche? Can't charge a Porsche at Porsche because I didn't buy the car from their network. I mean, they got to sort that out, by the way. Well, that that so, is a piss take. But it's another money thing, isn't it? It's, a, it's another controlling... Keep it all within it. It's sort of like that, you know. The but boys it's not their club. charger. It's not. It's not. It it's not be. a Porsche retail charger. Well, it, but they don't make them, mate. It'll be. It'll be Ionity or it, really? Yeah, there'll oh, be a okay. supply. There'll be a supplier of the yeah, charger. It'd yeah. be could be even be Shell or someone like that. It won't be standalone Porsche. Someone will make the chargers, and then Porsche will just take, cut of the cut of the electric Do the branding. Yeah, and, and <laughs> brand it. Yeah. yeah. So then, so then I think I gets on the app. I was told to download Zap. Zap Maps, which is yeah, yeah, it's very, very good, good very good Zap Maps. Yeah. So I found some other chargers. I went to a Shell petrol station. That was a pain in the ass. They're was... slow. The, the Shell ones aren't. Well, they, they got some 175 kilowatt ones yeah. now, so they're quicker. Yeah. yeah, right. They did have some older ones, but three of the four didn't work, yeah. and the other one was being used. Yeah. So I couldn't go there. I then goes to BP, which is down the road. Uh, BP Pulse, which are the worst ones in the world, by the way, they're terrible. Uh, one, one of them, there was two people waiting for one. The other one didn't work. But the thing is, you know, all of this, no, nothing has changed. This, is, what you are talking about right now, nothing's changed. Is the same experience that both of us have had and spoken about for the last two to three years. Yeah, it, you know, and and nothing is changing. And the big problem is. Whilst there is still this rhetoric of go EV, it feels like the government and other, are doing so little to address these things. You know, it's it's actually quite ridiculous, and I'm borderline getting frustrated. Me too. Yeah. That we've just spent forty five minutes saying the exact same things, the exact same issues. Like it must be boring for you all because we've done this episode. You ex- six. But- Roll reverse. But you see, yeah, six yeah. or seven times before we've done this episode. So we can't both be lying. Like, but, yeah, <laughs> but we, we, as I say, how how is this still the exact, like, it yeah. is the exact same experience. And I know a lot of people come and say, it's getting better. There are more, ch- it's getting easier. It's, get-. it's not. It's not. Because it's still the exact same experience. And then on top of that, we saw British Vault, wasn't it? Basically have gone bust. Gone bust. Administration, yeah. yeah. And the government refused to help. So yeah. that's great. So now we have no... EV or electric automotive industry because yep. that was freaking brilliant. It's the diesel story all over again, I'm telling you. We have no sort of support or incentives around yeah, infrastructure. I think in the House of Commons they were talking about how this can be an absolute disaster. Um, we see some manufacturers, maybe like Porsche, slightly distancing themselves or moving away from the entire focus of electric vehicle development. Um, they had some big step forwards with their synthetic fuels and actually on the 
on them. No synthetic fuels. Uh, P1, who I did the stuff with 360 last year, and I've got some cool plans with P1 performance fuels this year. They just announced in the German, or lobby to the German government, or a big thing, that they want to open a synthetic fuels fuel station in Berlin. Brilliant. So they offered to fuel the entire German government fleet with carbon neutral fuel. And they would do it. They'd set up a specific fuel station with only carbon neutral fuel. Okay, fine. It's expensive, but the whole point, the reason they're doing it, I think they're saying it's like six euros a litre. So it's, But the reason they're doing it is because they need the government to reduce the taxes on some of the things that they're using within their fuel and create incentives to bring that cost down. Yeah. And so they're saying, right, well, we'll fuel all of your cars. We're there. You can see the benefits of it. You can proclaim to the world that you've got a carbon neutral fleet. And then with those benefits, you can then start to go, okay, right, well, we should actually help these guys out because in the short term, this is a much quicker way to get carbon neutral fuel to the masses yeah. whilst we and that, uh, assess and improve this electric vehicle situation. Because as I say, I, I am genuinely annoyed at the fact that we have just sat here for so long and had the exact same conversation that we've had so many times. We are beating the same drum and we sound like boring old men yeah. making the same point. And that annoys me because I've said it before and I think you now see this, this the same thing. The products are getting fantastic. Yeah. The actual vehicles are getting really good. Yeah. But I have always known, you know, we have, we have, we have had... And we have got electric cars in stock. We don't hold many because we're a performance dealership, but we have had the odd few come through. And we've driven them sporadically, and you know, I freeze that uh, that uh, you know they don't have a lot of charge and stuff. And there are there's BMWs out there now that that are three hundred mile ranges, and there's uh, there's other manufacturers like you said that Mercedes that's one hundred and sixty grand, so that's out really that car because that's not really affordable. And like I said to you earlier on, for the general human being that just goes to work, why in God's earth would you spend 40, 45,000 quid on an electric car with absolutely no benefit at all to buying a petrol car, which is half price? Half price, easier to run, less stress, less hassle. You know, everything. The uh, benefit is only if you're a company if you have a company car and you're a company car user or you're a company director that is where the benefit comes in because we, of the tax relief we haven't even talked about the fact of the used used ev prices and the yeah. absolute disaster that is tons of evs now coming back to market at with no value, so you're losing a ton of money at resale. Well, Tesla's been the big one with all of that. There's been, you know, there's Audi e-tron as well. Yeah, horrific. but they've but they've always been bad. You yeah, know, when they tanked. first come out, when they first come out, a Audi e-tron, Audi were flapping about them cars because I remember because they the, the ranges were terrible on them. They couldn't get the bloody things to work. They wouldn't work properly. That car has been a bit of a bad egg for Audi in general because I remember when it came out I remember when it was launched yeah, yeah, yeah. I was involved in the Audi dealerships and they used to say this is a nightmare this yeah, car disaster. it's an absolute disaster but but you're now getting a surplus of used electric vehicles which no one wants right because there's no the, the new car benefits or the new car oh, and who wants a used well, EV you don't, you don't you don't buy a used company car electric car you get a new one that's you? what that's what i mean yeah. so you know so 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 there's suddenly all these evs used evs sitting around on four courts that no one wants and yeah. so people are losing a ton of money on them and then there's the still continued argument about the actual you know you said the only benefit of course we have to talk about you know global emissions and and carbon emissions and things like that yeah yeah and okay fine we as a country but also as a uh, as a world as a as a race as a as humanity we're getting cleaner with generating our energy so historically it was the sort of 75,000 i think or 100,000 kilometer mark where an ev then started to uh, i thought it was 50,000 uh 50,000 miles yeah wasn't it but yeah. i think that is reducing right. as we produce greener energy but it is still there is still an outweigh there's still a number of time there and i think look at hybrids but look at also the cleaner cars that we are producing now combustion engine cars are also getting less emitted so yeah. it, you know there's a constant to and fro and I, I admit you know that that volvo research now is about three or four years old so things have the the, the scene has changed slightly but yeah you know are we in or is there an impending ev crisis i don't think it's unreasonable to say potentially off the back of the fact that last year 
The UK sold more EVs than ever before. It's taking up a larger and larger chunk of new car sales. Sold. What comes into sold, though, is also registered, mate. Fine. I'm just... You know, let's yeah, just talk about the because you know, let's not get into uh, yeah. how many GBXs were sold. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sold. <laughs> <laughs> but my point, my point being, you know, theoretically more EVs on the road than ever before. Still, the same problems everyone is experiencing. Three years later, that we've all been banging on about, and at Christmas was highlighted the cost increasing for the vehicles, but also the charging, like. Charging is expensive. If you're and becoming more and more expensive, it's expensive. More, yeah, so, and that's what I mean. So. Are it, it, are we heading to a point where this could all start to become a bit of a disaster? And maybe, as you say, Dieselgate, which, you know, with the government pushing in one direction and then having to do a bit of a U-turn. Yeah. And could we see at some point this year or in the next couple of years, government ha- having to start to backtrack slightly? I, I don't think it's unfathomable. Well, we've seen it before, so it's not. It's definitely not unfab. Uh, uh, it's a big word, isn't it? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't want to say. It. <laughs> I, I struggled. You know I saw I mean? you yeah. Yeah, yeah, I might as well yeah. just get out and go home. Of course. Um, um, the I, I I don't I don't think that as well. I I. I do I think that EV will be here in ten years? Yes, I do. Oh, Oh, one hundred percent. It will be a form. They need to. They, they, it's, it's it's definitely here to stay. But like I said earlier on. The very fact that it's not for everyone, it's no good for that reason because the government want it to be for everyone. So, and it can't be for everyone. So, it's not a thing. I'm just going to see what uh, some of our live listeners on Recast uh, might be saying. Uh, lots of them are still talking about Pasha from, <laughs> from earlier oh, on. Hey. Uh, so, uh, Johnny Smith is saying there's a small 2% benefit in kind on an electric car, but basically nothing as Tony says. Charging is very car specific. Porsches don't charge as fast as Tesla. They can easily get 250 kilowatts when preconditions. That's a Tesla. Uh, Gareth Jones, Tony is spot on with electric cars being uh, in companies. Works very well. We advise our clients it's very tax efficient versus combustion engine cars. Benefit in kind is now 2% of list price and will increase to 5% in 2027, 2028. So not totally free in terms of tax, but a very low rate. Yeah. Um, so useful to have some comments from our lovely uh, live. It's still loads cheaper than a petrol car. So they may have moved the goalpost slightly, ladies and gentlemen. And thanks for after calling me out on that but it is basically for nothing yeah you know, no 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 you know, and they're agreeing that is, it's, yeah, yeah. it's useful it, to have that information yeah uh, and by the way if you're just wondering where we're getting these comments from just a reminder we do live stream our recording sessions over on recast there's always a link in the description you can go and check those out i mean the thing is we could sit here for another three hours blabbing on about this and yeah. i think you know we have done so many times before and you know, I wanted to revisit it because it became such a big talking point over Christmas. And I, we both received so many messages. Yeah, we did. Yeah. And it was amazing timing that you had this yeah. Taycan coming over the weekend. And great to hear that you had a positive experience in whole, but but learned some things. But I just, you know, as you were talking, I was sitting there being like, oh my God, how many times have we said this? Like, to sit there be like, oh, like, we just sound like a broken record. Yeah, but it's true though. But man. it's true. Yeah. I, like, we're not here as bashers. No. We're just telling our experience. And it's so annoying that that, continues to be our experience so look as ever we want to hear from you what are your thoughts have you changed your mind or your position on electric vehicles in the last six months or so uh are you finding it better or worse put it in the comment section of course we'll review that and we all pick this up again in a couple of months time i think i'm desperate so soon to, yeah so soon. <laughs> i'm desperate to get hold of an ev and do a bit of a living with an ev segment um i i put just done that i've just done it no but you just done it over the weekend i'm talking about i want to run it for like three months right yeah just to really see you know because anyway so i think you would be all right but that's what i want to do i've got a home charge and so that's what i mean i want to spend proper time yeah um so we'll see we will revisit it uh, again we have to it's the biggest conversation topic really within automotive and it continues to be so um before we sign off and i will talk a little bit more about them uh next week you might have noticed uh custodian hats knocking around the last few weeks and i actually mentioned them in a video with the 360 end of last year um it's a super useful app for managing like your garage or your cars i I actually signed up and started using it for the 360 because you can digitalize like all the paperwork all the history files all the maintenance all the i was just loving it and super nice i started chatting to the guys and basically decided to try and do some work together because i think it's brilliant and they're going to help facilitate some really cool content later in the year which is great but also i kind of just love what they're doing and think lots of you might find it useful actually we should talk about it because there could be a point where for you it helps where if you get a car into stock even you're not three years old 
all the history file, all the paperwork, everything that you might need would just be on the app. Right. And when you sell it, you could just sell, send somebody that information yeah. on the app. So it just Very good. could make all of our lives easier. So if you own one car or 10 cars and managing MOTs and plans and service schedules and prepping for uh, Bista Heritage Scramble and good, if you just want to aid yourself in managing that, Custodian are mega. Um, so I just want to give them a quick shout out because I literally was just chatting to them this week. Um, I should probably do a more formal conversation about what they do and describe everything i'd like um, to know about it yeah no they're re- really really cool so uh, actually i'll put a link to them below but yeah the hats are here and we are going to be doing some work together this year so i'll hear some more about them but just wanted to give them a quick shout out now we've got to draw a line under things because we, we we've got to end up uh, uh, finish our, our live we've gone well over on that uh and we're a little bit long on this podcast as well but um it's been it's been interesting it's yeah been an interesting chat um didn't really talk too much about my gt3 in the end because we had to do that we recorded <laughs> well you had a spasm but we were on next week <laughs> when i would have been on some kind of trip god knows where god knows in what conditions and god knows on what tires but uh, fingers crossed according to some dodgy guy on ebay um, on some winter tires so we will find out uh, anyway uh, if you want to follow tony he's at tony Grawood car sales on most social media platforms you can get behind the scenes looks on his adventures with things like a tie can because he's often posting stories uh, follow me at seen through glass to, to see some hopefully behind the scenes elements of whatever road trip i go on this week <laughs> and uh, yeah we'll be back see him in a ditch <laughs> for another episode <laughs> and another live stream on recast next week see you then bye bye see ya uh, thank you, recasters. Sorry that we went on a bit long there. Uh, my fault for just being absolutely useless um, at, uh, uh, at getting my words out. But uh, hopefully you enjoyed it. And yeah, next week we'll be back again uh, Monday, same time uh, for yeah some insights into my first road trip, my first 1,000 miles in the GT3. Bye-bye. See ya.